1956, a paper was published by the cognitive psychologist George A. Miller. This paper, titled The Magic Number Seven, went on to become one of the most frequently cited papers in all of psychology. In the paper, Miller identified what is perhaps today one of the best known cognitive bottlenecks on human cognition. His discovery was that for almost all of us, the largest number of items that we can remember and subsequently recall in correct order is seven, plus or minus two. In fact, this is true with such regularity that it's come to be known as Miller's Law. And yet, every year, a group of men and women come together from all over the world to compete in the World Memory Championships, where they memorize not just seven items, not just nine items, but hundreds of digits in mere minutes, or the order of a shuffled deck of cards in mere seconds. So what is it? What is it that sets these memory marvels apart from the rest of us? Well, in the next 10 minutes and 46 seconds, <laughs> I'm going to answer this question, and I'm also hopefully going to have every member of this audience break Miller's law. In the space of this talk, you are all going to go from having ordinary memories to being extraordinary. But how do I know how to do this? Who am I to answer this question? Well, as it happens, I'm a memory athlete. I was runner-up, not quite champion, at the uh, memory championships, the Australian memory championships in 2011. And I also set an Australian memory record by memorizing the order of 99 abstract shapes. But my powers of memory don't come from any natural talents or innate abilities. In fact, it's precisely because I struggled with my memory that I sought out ways to improve it. And it was then that I discovered the art of memory, a group of loosely associated principles and techniques designed to aid in recall, to organize information, and to boost creativity. I then sought out Tanz Lali, who, in addition to being Australia's most successful competitive mnemonist, being twice the Australian memory champ, also memorized the entire Sydney Yellow Pages. Yeah, that's right. And the feat only took him 24 days. So I asked the question earlier, what is it that these guys know that we don't? Why can they do these incredible things, but the rest of us struggle to remember a shopping list or our pin codes or phone numbers? Well, I'm going to answer that question, and then having given you all a crash course in the fundamental techniques of effective remembering, we're going to, do, we're going to put those skills to the test, we're going to do a practical example. But to begin with, the basics. All effective remembering essentially involves three principles. These are mindfulness, visual, imaginative encoding, and organization. And I'm going to go into these in more detail. So to begin with, mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is perhaps best understood in terms of its absence. Everyone here, I'm sure, has had the experience of walking or driving somewhere familiar, and then of turning up at the door with no clear memory of exactly how you got there. You were just sort of on autopilot. You were, for that time, an attentionless zombie, making your way through the world without any conscious inner life. Now, it might seem so obvious as not be worth mentioning, but most failures of memory are, I think, failures of attention. To offer one very simple example, on the Australian $1 coin, which way does the queen's head face? Left or right? Now, of course, it's very easy to give an answer to this question. You have a 50% chance to get it right. But ask yourselves, do you know the answer? Or did you have to guess? Most of us don't know the answer, and this is despite the fact that literally hundreds of coins have passed under our noses and through our fingers uh, each month and have done for years. The point here is that because none of us ever really bothered to check, most of us don't know which direction the Queen's head faces. And for the record, she faces to the right. So if you want to remember something, the first step is to be aware of it. And in fact, learning to be present in order to form stronger memories of our past forces us to enjoy a richer present. And since this is, as far as we know, the only life we get, the only chance we have to make our way through the world, 
Learning to be present for that journey is, in a sense, a matter of life and death. Now, the next two stages, those of uh, visual, imaginative encoding and organization, go hand in hand. There are certain kinds of information that we're all naturally very, very good at remembering. No one, for instance, after being given the grand tour of their mate's new apartment, has to then sit down with a blueprint and wrote learn the layout. Rather, after a couple of minutes of wandering around, we can, with relative ease, mentally navigate through that space. The trick then to effective remembering is to transform information with which we normally struggle, so that could be course notes, pin codes, uh, TEDx speeches, into a form that is more brain-friendly and effortlessly memorable. And a very, very easy way to do this is to create a mental, visual story. To offer an example, let's say we want to remember a shopping list. Which is the more memorable mental image? A pack of sausages or a string of sausages which, when accosted by a hungry dog, rears up like a cobra and tries to take a bite out of the surprised pup? <laughs> the key then to making things memorable, the point here is that by creating mental images that are interesting and so on, we're, we're transforming the mundane into the memorable. So having now given you a kind of crash course in, in the fundamental principles of effective remembering, we're going to run through an exercise. And what we're going to do is we're going to remember, we're going to learn the, first 12, the names of the first 12 speakers as they appear in the book that many of you have uh, hanging around your neck. So you can test yourselves afterwards, and I encourage you to test one another as well. So what I want you to do now is close your eyes, and as I tell you this story, I want you to, with as much kind of creative energy as you can, paint a colourful mental picture. And really feel free to let your imagination one, run wild and, and create really sort of caricaturish images. The art of memory is as much an exercise in creativity and fun as it is in fidelity. So, our story begins in your kitchen. You went to your kitchen one day to make yourself a sandwich, but when you get there, you find a crane. I'm talking about the bird here, not the piece of construction equipment. And it's flapping its wings, and it's pecking at something inside your fridge. Now, crane rhymes with Karen, the name, or sounds like Karen, the name of our first speaker, and this is how we're going to remember her name. And you follow the line of the crane's neck, and you peer around the door of your fridge, and you realize that this crane is trying to make a feast of a brain, in fact, it's Brian's brain. Brian is our next speaker. And as you look closer, you realize that the brain is actually sweating. Now, you'll notice that memory stories don't have to conform to the regular rules of biology. <laughs> and the reason that it's sweating is because your fridge door no longer leads to your fridge. It now leads out to a summer's day. Summer is the name of the next speaker. She's unfortunately no longer speaking, but she's in the book, so she stays in my story. Now, really feel the warmth on your face coming from your fridge. <laughs> At this point, you decide, OK, I obviously got up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm going to go back to bed. You head up to your bedroom. But when you get there, your, the door is blocked by Hannah. Now, what makes Hannah even more memorable is the fact that she's wielding a hammer. In fact, the hammer is twice her size. And she swings it in a large arc, and it comes down, and with a crack, it breaks open a brick. Brick rhymes with Vic, the name of our next speaker. The brick breaks open, and inside is a jewel. Jewel sounds like Julie. So you can't get into your bedroom. You decide to head to the bathroom, splash some water on your face, try to pull yourself together. And when you get there, you meet an android named Andrew. And he's covered in flashing lights and whirring dials and so on. And he's pulling on a pulley. And this is how we're going to remember the name of our next speaker, Upuli. And because of the effort involved, Andrew the android has blisters on his hands. And blisters is how we're going to remember bliss. Now, at this point, you realize it's your house that's gone mad, not your head. And you decide the best thing to do is just to get out of there. 
So you head down to your garage. When you get to your garage, however, you find that your car is suspended from the ceiling by a peg. Peg rhymes with Greg, the name of our next speaker. And sitting at the steering wheel is Peter Rabbit. And he's wearing his little blue coat, and he's got his big floppy rabbit ears, and Peter is the name of our next speaker. <laughs> so obviously your own car is unavailable to you, but fortunately, just at that moment, a rally car pulls up in your drive, driven by Sally. And so you hop into Sally's rally car, and she drives you off into the sunset. So now what I'd like you to do is check with yourselves and check to see that you can run through that story in your mind, that you've got each of the scenes there from your kitchen and your bedroom to the bathroom to the garage. And provided you can do that, then you've just managed to learn 12 names, well and truly over the limit set by Miller's Law. But what's really important here is that if you can learn 12 names in this way, then there's nothing preventing you from simply extending that story and memorizing 12 more. In fact, the world record for names and faces memorized in five minutes is 70 names and faces. Unbelievable. So now that you guys are all memory athletes, how can you use these techniques to get the most out of today? Well, I'm privileged to be sharing the stage with some phenomenal storytellers. So that bit's more or less taken care of for you. So my advice is this. Be present. Pay close attention. Think visually, and think about how these ideas worth sharing connect to your own larger stories as they extend beyond today. I wish you all a very, very memorable day. Thank you.